Hello, Southwest Church Online. Welcome back home to Southwest Church. We're a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, and we love discipleship. I am so excited about today's message, excited about this Christmas season and all that the coming of Jesus means to you and to I. We're going to get in God's word right after this. Welcome back home to Southwest Church Online. Family, let's go ahead and move now to God's word. If you have your Bibles, uh, meet me in Matthew chapter one. We're looking at verses one through 17. We are in a brand new series that we have entitled, And This Christmas Will Be. Can I get a Donny Hathaway witness out there? Hang on the mistletoe. I'm gonna get to know you better. This Christmas Anyways, that's that's the inspiration to remind ourselves that because of Jesus Christ coming into the world, this Christmas can be special. And so what we're doing with this series is we're bringing to bear what I like to call those truths and tributes that those familiar Christmas narratives ought to stir up in our hearts as we would in any Christmas series. We're dusting off those familiar passages to, if you will, reestablish that awe and wonder that we ought to have concerning the love of Jesus as we enter towards uh, the Christmas season. Now, of course, the question that I like to answer every Christmas is this, why? Like, why do we always come back to these passages? Why do we come back to the same old familiar stories? Why do we assume that there's fresh meaning in old stories? It's because in my years, I've learned this in my Christmas season, that if you're not careful, you'll do all the Christmas things, but still miss Christmas. Have you ever experienced that in your life? You kind of go through all the rigmarole of all the trappings surrounding Christmas, and before you know it, it's middle of January, and you didn't really experience the awe and the wonder of that uh, season. There's stories told of a, of a mom. She was a new mom. She had given uh, birth to a brand new baby boy, and she wanted to have a big party to celebrate it. So she had this big party, uh, decorated her house, um, invited all her friends. Uh, they ate the delicious food, the drank the delicious drinks. They played games, all of the festivities and the fanfare. And finally, uh, one of the ladies says, well, hey, bring out your son. We would like to, to meet the baby boy. So the mom runs upstairs, goes to her baby's crib and to her shock, the baby's not there. And mama is frantically looking around the room. She's starting to freak out. And that's when it hits her. She remembers, oh, that's right. I dropped my baby off at my parents' house this morning so I can get ready for the party. And I hope you are getting the lesson. They were all so consumed with the birthday party that they forgot all about whose birthday it was. And my hope and encouragement for you this Christmas is that you'll not go through all of the consumption of the birthday parties, the Christmas parties, and miss the reason as to whose birthday it is all about. If you're not careful, you'll do all the Christmas things. So y'all allow me to pastor you a little bit before we preach and gift to you what I like to call some some Christmas encouragements to make sure that you don't make the mistake of going through all the Christmas things and still missing Christmas. So the first one I want to encourage you is to remember your Savior. We've provided some passages here that are all surrounding the Christmas narratives. I've learned in my life that if I put God's word in my heart, God's truth will manifest in my life. And every year this time, what I do is I reread these Christmas narratives over and over again. I get Christmas into my heart so that Christmas can be manifested in my life. So remember your Savior. Number two, remember your rhythms. You're going to be pulled left and right, okay? Right? It's going to be happening. You got work stuff happening. You got family stuff happening. You got uh, uh, parties happening. But remember those rhythms that keep you strong and keep you sane. If you're married and you do date night every week, still do date night every week. If you have family day every weekend, 
still have family there every weekend. Don't allow the hustle and the bustle of the season to detract you too far away from those rhythms that constantly keep you sound. I end up experiencing with a lot of people that I know and love that that December comes. They don't just miss December. They miss January too because they're still trying to recover to get themselves back in rhythm. So hold to some sort of rhythm in your life during this season. Which leads to the third point. Remember your health. I don't think I'm talking to nobody, but Ricky Jenkins right now. Can I get a witness that we don't have to gain five pounds this month? We don't have to do this. We can be healthy. We can eat well. Yeah, we're going to fudge a little bit. And I do mean that literally. Okay, we're going to have some party. We're going to do all that kind of stuff. But remember your Sabbath and remember to get your sleep, friends, and remember that you've only got one temple. Take care of it as best as you can. And then fourthly and finally, remember your family. I'm guilty here. Sometimes I can be working so hard to give my family a great Christmas that I actually miss out on being with my family. And I want to encourage you, whether your family is your blood relatives or whether your family is your circle that God has entrusted to you, it's the, it's the presence, it's the moments, it's the conversations that is really the, the essence of what it means to celebrate the coming of Jesus and remember your family at that time. That's enough pastoring for now. Let's get to uh, the meat of God's word. Uh, last week, Pastor Kenton gave us one of our tributes of the Christmas season that we should be thankful. Today, I want to uh, present one of those truths that Christmas above all is a reminder that God has been graceful. It's been uh, dark and God has been silent for 400 years. Then in the midst of the darkness, the light shines. Matthew has captured the episode for us, and he writes to us these words. Hear now the word of Almighty God. Matthew writes, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron. And Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nishan, and Nishan, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. Are you still with me? Let's keep going. And Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheltiel, and Sheltiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathen, and Mathen the father of Jacob. Almost done, stay with me. And Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And even in this, I've read from the greatest book ever written. And I bear witness this day that all of its words are true. Amen? Amen. Now to answer the question that's on everybody's mind who's still tuned in, what in the world just happened? <laughs> To do so, I remind you of a history, uh, 1983, when a company entitled Ancestry Publishing uh, was founded. Uh, her progenitors envisaged a family history magazine that eventually published some 40 volumes detailing the riches of exploring one's family uh, history. 
eventually this magazine caught on like wildfire and sensing that a movement was brewing ancestry publishing started to invest heavily into genealogical research and technology and dna science the years pass and eventually the onset of the computer movement happens alongside dna science and they had to launch something that's now known popularly as ancestry.com the rest, as they say, is history. From now on, Americans would enjoy right now access to old time history. As we move forward in years, fast forwarding some three decades later, Ancestry.com is now heralded around the world as one of the most successful ventures in Internet history. They handle some 1 billion family searches each and every month to the tune of 13 billion complete profiles published throughout their history. I say all that to say as we tiptoe to Matthew chapter 1 that Matthew is offering his readers a biblical ancestry.com. He's giving his readers and therefore giving you and I uh, right now access to old time history. And in so doing, he's gifting to us this wonderful display of the gracefulness of God. I like to walk through one of the lesser preached passages and in so doing, talking about how Christmas means that God has been gracious to you and gracious to me. Table of contents for our time. Matthew in this genealogy is announcing first and foremost that Christmas means that grace has come. Christmas means furthermore that grace has come to all. And in light of that truth, I think the application for you and I is this, no matter what's going on in your life, don't quit. I'd like to tag this text, and this Christmas will be graceful. Let's pray. Jesus, would you bless this, this gathering, Father of hearts and minds. God, that even in this passage, Lord, seemingly obscure and tedious, Father God, there will be power, there will be redemption, there will be hope and peace and love as we celebrate the coming of Jesus. God, would you speak? Father, would you take this meager fish and bread and multiply it to feed many? For we ask it in Jesus' name and every heart said together, amen. Now listen, we're going to be in the classroom a lot, but I promise we're coming to church. I know this passage was tough to chew through, but trust me, there is a word in the word of God. The first point, I think, with all of this, to summarize what Matthew is doing, I think is this idea that Christmas means that grace has come. One of my favorite scholars said of the Christmas story that to understand Christmas is to understand basic Christianity, which is the gospel. Stay that and stay with me and hold that thought in your heart that if you can get to a place where you understand Christmas, you will at the same time understand Christianity. That I would suggest to you is being hinted at in the passage that we just read. So think about Christmas, think about the Bible, think about the trappings of Christmas, the nativity scenes, as you consider the story of Christmas. Uh, the angels announcing that Jesus was coming and the shepherds minding their flocks by night. Uh, the wise men, the, the magi following the stars that guided them overhead what, for what was plausibly a two-year journey to go and visit the young toddler, Jesus Christ. Elizabeth and John the Baptist, and then ultimately Mary and Joseph, this couple who is struggling in poverty and abject circumstances, and they stumble into Bethlehem, and there is no room at the inn, and plausibly they find a stable with animals, or maybe it's a cave and the Bible says they finally birth Jesus and it's obviously there's a frantic situation as they grab whatever cloth they can they they swaddle their baby and of course scripture says that they would lay Jesus down in a manger and often we've imagined the manger as a wooden trough where the animals would have fed, but we've done some work to understand that most mangers in the ancient world would have been carved out of stone, but in the most meager of circumstances, a manger simply would have been a trough dug out into a hole. It is very plausible that the Christ child would have been laid into a hole, and the message of Christmas is this, Jesus was born into a hole that someday I might climb out of mine. Ah, that's the gospel. 
that Jesus came to us in our hole of our sin, that all who put their trust and faith in Jesus might know hope and might know peace. This is the message of Christmas. To understand Christmas is to understand Christianity. And that's what Christmas is screaming to us. Even in this passage, Christmas is screaming to us. Get this in your spirit that regardless of the hole you find yourself in today, Jesus comes to you in that hole and he loves you and he accepts you and he brings you out of that hole. The world is dark. The world is cold, the world is broken, yet Jesus comes into that reality to bring you out of it. That's Christianity. You see, every other religion teaches you that some guru or some prophet or some seer comes and he says to the people, do these things and pray these prayers and follow these rules and accomplish these tasks. And then you can have this closeness to God or to peace or to nirvana or to uh, enlightenment that I have. Yes, yes, yes. You come yourself and put yourself up by your bootstraps and and accomplish these tasks and, and, and do this performance and you can get to where I am. Christmas is the announcement that God threw away all that. Every other religion says, do this and do that. My gospel says that Jesus came and he did this and he did that. Hallelujah. That all who put their trust and faith in him would have the right to eternal life. That's Christmas. Christmas says God sent a savior and he did this and he did that. That all who put their trust and faith in him can be made whole. So what's the message of Christmas? Grace has come. And believe it or not, friends, stay with me. Believe it or not, that entire message is hidden in all these seemingly random and tedious genealogies that we just read through, which brings me to the ultimate question I want to answer with our time together of our passage. And it's this, how does that gospel show up in Matthew chapter one, verses one through 17? And I would say to us who've been reading in the passage, that's a fair question, right? I grew up, um, uh, some of y'all know that I grew up with a drug problem. I was drugged to church. I was drugged to Sunday night service. I was drugged to Wednesday. I, I grew up on drugs. I was in church all the time. And I had parents who made us read the Bible. Like, you, like, like I didn't read the Bible because I was faithful. I read the Bible because I was fearful. <laughs> like my parents would lock us up in a room and literally make us read the Bible. And in those days, you had a King James Bible and this passage reads so differently than King James. So in our translation, it's saying, okay, Abraham had Isaac and Isaac had Jacob and, and, and Jacob had this person and, and, and this person had this person. In the antiquated King James, the word begat is peppered through all the passages, right? So it's like, and Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah, and Judah begat and begat, begat, begat. So much so that in the King James Version of this passage, there are 39 begats. And my parents would say, okay, you got to go read Matthew 1 today. So here I am reading all these begats. And I don't know about y'all, but I would act like I was begatting, but I wasn't begatting. I would be getting past all that begatting so I could be getting something I could actually understand. Can I get a witness right there? I mean, Amina Bab and Deshaun and all this kind of stuff. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce the names. I was just saying it confidently so y'all would think I knew what I was talking about. Right? Like like Matthew 1, like what in the world is going on here? But here's what I learned over the years about those seemingly strange and odd and frivolous passages in the Bible. God doesn't waste ink. Friend, every jot and every tittle of scripture, there is a word for you. Every word of God has power and bears eternal significance for us. So this is what I want you to hear for now in Matthew chapter one, the author ultimately more than anything else, and somebody needs to hear this, that he's reminding us that God keeps his promises. God is a keeper of a promise. If you're in a living room right now, if you're in a cubicle next to somebody, I dare you to high five them and say, God told me to tell you that God keeps his promises. God keeps his promise. Somebody needs to hear that today, that God is a keeper of his promises. And I heard the psalmist saying, for those of you who are brokenhearted, that weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. 
And I heard Paul say in Philippians 3 that our God is the God who promises peace that passes understanding that shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. For those of you who are struggling today, the promise of God is this. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. God is a keeper of his promises. The old folks in my old church would say that God may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. My my grandmama used to say that he is a bridge over troubled waters. My auntie used to say he's bread when I'm hungry and he's water when I'm thirsty. The old preacher used to say that he's a doctor in a sick room and a lawyer in a courtroom. And I heard Paul saying, now unto him who was able to do exceeding and abundantly and above all that we ever ask or even think according to the power that works in us. If you hear nothing else in this sermon today, hear this and get it in your spirit. Christmas means that God is a keeper of his promises. He will see you through. That is the word of almighty God that God keeps his promises. That's what Matthew's doing here. He's reminding his Jewish readers that God keeps his promises, that in the coming of Jesus, God has kept his most essential, most oft repeated promise of the Old Testament. Notice in verse one, okay, the names of patriarchs appear. There's Abraham on the one side and David on the other. This would have signaled, hey, I need to listen to this, to those Jewish readers. Why? Because the Old Testament promise that the Messiah ultimately would come through Abraham, okay, and his people, and then ultimately as a son of the house of David. That's what Matthew is pointing out, that in the birth of Jesus, God was honoring at least two essential covenant promises. The first would have come to Abraham. Whereby God says, Abraham, I'm going to give you, I'm going to multiply your seed. It'll number the stars of heaven and the sands of the sea. And God's promises to Abraham was this, through you, I'm going to raise up a people that will be Israel. But years later, in fact, 14 generations later, God would echo that promise to David in the Davidic covenant. And he would say to David, whereas I told Abraham, I'm going to rise up a people to you. I'm saying through you, I'm going to rise up a person that is Jesus Christ. And of course, Matthew here is authenticating through the historical records that yes, Jesus Christ is that Messiah. He is the son of David. So what is Matthew then doing in the remainder of the verses? He's simply providing proof that this Jesus is that promise that he is the one. Stay with me. That's why he says in verse one, so woodenly, right? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. What is he doing? He's trying to authenticate Jesus. He's legitimizing Jesus. He's saying that this Jesus is that promise. Now stay with me because some of you are saying, why does it read so boringly? Why does it read so tediously? Why is it I just want to move past on them? But don't you see, that's exactly why this passage is so rich. Stay with me, because what's happening in Matthew chapter one is that what you don't see is Matthew saying to his readers, once upon a time, nor is Matthew saying to his readers, um, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. No, Matthew is saying, look, I'm a tax accountant. I've literally combed through the records and I've authenticated the witness. I've checked the records. So-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. And then comes Jesus. It's Matthew's way of saying, church, this is not fantasy. This is not fairy tale. Someone has come. Something has happened. Jesus really was born. Jesus really did grow up in Nazareth. Jesus really did have no sin. Jesus really did die on a cross. And three days later, Jesus really did got up. And the import of that is this, because Jesus really was born and Jesus really did die and Jesus really did resurrect. It means faith in him means that you really can have your sins washed away. You really can have hope in life brand new. You really can have peace in the midst of the storms because Jesus really was born. Jesus, that means you really can have hope. Grace has come and we really can be free. But as we extend the narrative, 
The text also implies that Christmas means grace has come to all. I love how the shepherds are the angels talking to the shepherds in Luke 2 says that this will be good news to all. Translation, everyone is included in this wonderful grace. So Matthew, of course, here is listing out Jesus's family tree. One scholar, R. Kent Hughes, commented that he does so with including three peculiarities that Hughes comments would have offended Matthew's pharisaical readers, self-righteous readers would not have been impressed by this genealogy. In fact, they would have been offended by it, but I want to bear witness that that's good news for you and for me. So there are at least three peculiarities in this genealogy, and they are, of course, the inclusion of women, think disrespected people, the inclusion of Gentiles, think disregarded people, and then finally, the inclusion of failures, think dismissed people, all appear in the genealogy of Jesus. Now, of course, the question is this, why is that such a big deal? Well, remember this, this is the ancient world. Okay, and the way through which you moved up in the ancient world was not on account of your individual accomplishments, but ultimately on account of your entire family's accomplishments. That flies in the face of the modern world, right? Like the way you and I move up, we are in an individualized world. And the way you and I move up is through what we've done and what we say and how we act and how we achieve, right? Like when you introduce yourself, as soon as you say your name, the second thing you say is what you do, right? Before we even care about whether or not you're married and a relationship or, or got kids and all this kind of stuff, the second question we ask you is what do you do? Why? Because that is how you achieve status in the modern world. The ancient world was not like that. The, in the ancient world, you achieve status through what your family has done for you, which is why this passage is so ironic because Jesus is essentially saying in the inclusion of disrespected people and disregarded people and dismissed people that this is one of the most worst resumes ever produced in the ancient New Testament world. Jesus is literally bragging on a family history and resume that would have gotten him canceled. And it's good news for you and I, right? Let me put it this way. Have you ever fudged on a resume? Come on now, we're in church. You can be honest. Have you ever just, even just slightly stretched the truth a little bit? on your resume, right? Because this is a resume that Jesus is giving uh, to, to, to the world and, 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 and he's not fudging on it. But have, have you ever been guilty of fudging on it? For instance, you were a fry cook at, at Five Guys, but by the time it made it to your resume, it said advanced culinary engineer. Like you, you used to mow grass, Okay, you mowed grass. But by the time it got to your resume, it said um, uh, extensive background in geomorphological architecture and design. Okay, you, you, you put on your resume uh, proficient in multiple software applications, but you ain't even got no computer. <laughs> we are all guilty of fudging a little bit on our resume, but as we tiptoe towards Matthew chapter one, there's no fudge. Jesus did exactly the opposite. Take case in point that there are five women that appear in this genealogy. Ruth and Tamar and Bathsheba is implied here and, and other women that, that, that appear here. Women were disrespected in their society. Their voice had no power, held no sway in court. They were at the very bottom of the socioeconomic spectrum. And Jesus proudly includes his five mothers in this passage. What was the message? If you feel disregarded today, Jesus says, come and worship at the manger and hide behind the cross. Notice throughout the genealogy of Jesus that there are also Gentiles that are peppered throughout the passage. In fact, some of the moms were Ruth and Bathsheba. They all would have been regarded as Gentiles, right? Gentiles, according to the law, were excluded, but here Jesus and his grace is including them, right? They were racial outsiders. They were disregarded by the Jews, but here Jesus is regarding them as a part of his family history. And thirdly and finally, there were failures here, moral 
failures. And some of you are watching right now, and you failed somewhere morally. You haven't been as good as you could have been in the way of pride. You haven't stewarded your finances well. You have dishonored a relationship. You've dishonored a marriage. You've struggled with a vice or a substance abuse or a sin issue. But notice that even failures are being included in the genealogy of Jesus. Consider the evidence Abraham was a liar. Judah sold his brother into slavery. Rehoboam, Abijah, and Ahaz were all wicked kings. Judah and Tamar committed incest. Okay? Rahab was a prostitute. Bathsheba technically cheated on her husband by sleeping with King David. I know it was only 2% her fault, but last time I checked, she didn't have no business taking a bath outside on a roof. Aptly named Bathsheba. Splish, splash, she was taking. Anyways, okay. Uh, David was a womanizer, an adulterer, and a murderer. And finally, Solomon was a hedonist, had a thousand women in his court that he slept with all the time. All failures, but all made it into the greatest story ever told. What is the message? Jesus loves disrespected people. Jesus loves disregarded people. Jesus loves dismissed people. That is the gospel. Hear it regardless of who you are, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what family you came, you sprung from, regardless of what your habits are, regardless of what your beliefs are, regardless of what your doubts are, regardless of what their strengths are or your weaknesses. Jesus says this message to you. I did not come for the already fixed up. I came to fix up the already broken, which leads us to our application today. And I hope you hear my hearts. Because of this, I think our Christmas application, regardless of what we're going through right now, don't quit. Christmas means don't quit. If a prostitute can be redeemed, so can we. If a murderer can be redeemed, so can we. If wicked kings can be redeemed, so can we. If liars can be redeemed, so can we. And I just wanted you to be remindful of the fact that because Jesus was born into a hole, it means that you can get out of the one that you're in when you put your faith in him. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going. Keep moving in the things of the Lord. Some of you are wanting to quit marriage. Don't quit. Some of you are wanting to quit a family member, don't quit. Some of you wanting to quit a, a terrible experience. Maybe God, maybe, just maybe God is saying, don't quit. Because if I came into this reality 2,000 years ago, I'll come into your reality today. It's interesting in closing that that word genealogy has the same root word as the word Genesis. They're literally the same word. In many ways, Matthew is saying the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ, the book of the beginning, essentially saying to his readers that the coming of Jesus means that there is a new beginning. And this is the good news of the gospel, that regardless of where your story may be today in its current chapter, Jesus says, I offer you a new beginning when you put your trust and faith in me. Is that you? Could you use a new beginning? Could you use a new start? Could you use a blank slate? Well, we believe this, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And he rose again, meaning that regardless of where you are in your story right now, your story can finish well when you put your trust and faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you. And I encourage you now to just whisper these words of faith. Jesus Christ, would you come into my heart? Please forgive me of all of my sin as I put my faith in what you've accomplished for me in your life, death, burial, and resurrection. And God, present to me this grace that you give that comes to all regardless of who I am and what I've done. If these people can make it into your family, it means I can make it into your family as well. Come into my life and make me whole. If you pray that prayer, I want to just welcome you to the kingdom. I want to ask that you would acknowledge that in the chat windows on the portal through which you're experiencing this service so one of our pastors can follow up with you and know how to pray for you and encourage you on as we march forward in the things of the Lord. And this Christmas will be graceful. And until we meet again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. 
And I ask this blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And the church said, Amen. We'll see you next time.